Because what I say to him is this. I say, what you've just said now, that was difficult for you, right? And he goes, <laughs> in typical Australian way, he goes, bloody oath. That was hard. And I said, well, maybe you've just taught us all something. And maybe it's this. Maybe we need to go into one or two percent levels of discomfort before we make any progress on this front. And I really mean that. I think he taught me and the rest of the people in the room something massive. He didn't go 50 percent. He went one or two percent, maybe probably a bit more because he was feeling, you know, discomfort in saying it. It was it was uncomfortable for him. But I think if we can share that with people, it gives us permission to, to broach the little more, the, 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 the more difficult issues, you know, just veering slowly. There's no on off switch for trust. So we've got to take baby steps uh, and go into one or 2% levels of discomfort. I'm Talana Simpson and let's talk communication. Today we get to spend some time with Steve Simpson, who is based on the other side of the world in Melbourne, Australia. He is the creator of the UGRs, or Unwritten Ground Rules concept, which is used by companies across the world to understand and strategically improve their workplace cultures. As leaders, we need to communicate a lot. We need to be able to take like complex thoughts simplify them and get them across to our followers in a way that they, we can actually engage with them and get them to follow us, get them to, to buy into our vision and work with us. And you've managed to do this in, in a way, the way that you explain the complex concept of corporate culture. So Steve, thank you for being on our show. And I'd love you to just share a bit about um, your story of how you got to be where you are today and introduce us to the way that you as a leader in your field are able to explain culture so compellingly. Well, thanks, Talana. It's great to be with you. Um, I, I did a master's degree as a 25, 26-year-old in Canada. I got on a plane and headed off overseas and studied uh, over there. And um, as part of my studies, read about workplace culture or corporate culture, as it was more commonly called then, and to be honest with you, it didn't grab my attention all that much and finished my master's degree, came back down to Australia. And I went into the to head office of the education department in Western Australia. And in my late 20s, as I think most of us are, I was pretty bulletproof. And a director of an educational region um, approached me and said, Steve, would you facilitate a series of uh, conversations around different topics that we're holding with our school administration teams a month apart you know we'll give you the topics and you facilitate these conversations and maybe give some input as well so i'm bulletproof and i say yeah not a problem i can do that and uh i was preparing for the third or fourth one um and i hadn't really looked too much in advance and the next one up was on the notion of workplace culture so i went back to my books and reread what i'd studied and talana what i read <laughs> just seems so philosophical, so academic, so theoretical, so complicated. Yeah. I just thought to myself, I can't present this back to people. You know, I'm, I'm not going to do that. So something sparked in my mind and I reflected on the unwritten ground rules, or as I call them, the UGRs, that I'd experienced prior to going off to Canada because I was a teacher prior to going off to Canada. I'd, I'd reflected on the UGRs, the unwritten ground rules, that I'd experienced as a teacher. And that's the notion that I presented to this group of school administrators. And to be honest with you, I knew I was onto something because it just grabbed them. And, um, you know, I've been working on the notion uh, for 30 years and the last 20 years with my great friend and business partner, who's interestingly based in Joburg, Steph Duplessis. And we've developed it to a point where we've used it in companies large and small, um, to help them understand and strategically improve their culture. So UGRs, Unwritten Ground Rules, I define, and the definition is vital here, um, I define, define as people's perceptions of this is the way we do things around here. Now, that, that definition is vitally important. People's perceptions of this is the way we do things around here. And they can include things like 
at our meetings, it isn't worth complaining because we know nothing will get done. Uh, the only time anyone gets spoken to by the boss is when something is wrong. Uh, the company talks about the importance of service, but we know they don't really mean it, so we don't really have to worry about it, and so on. So these drive our behaviour, yet remarkably, are seldom, if ever, talked about openly. It's my contention that it is the UGRs, the Unwritten Grand Rules, that constitute an organisation's culture. Culture is simply people's perceptions of this is why we do things around here. It's the UGRs. And I think part of its power is its simplicity. I think your point's a good one, that a vital role of that leader's hold, I think, is talking about stuff that resonates with people. Mm. And that often requires simplifying it, not dumbing it down, not patronising people, but... I think part of the power of UGRs is it's real talk. You know, it's actually, you can't argue against UGRs because it's reality. Um, so, so, yeah, from a simple concept, you know, I had two universities get involved in World First Research. So, so now we can unearth the prevailing UGRs and we can talk about that if we want. But it's a very simple concept which hides immense complexity. I mean, it is... There's a lot of complexity that sits behind it, but I think it being able to resonate with people. We, like I've been to Joburg many times. We've worked with gold miners and gold mining companies and taught them about UGRs. And these guys, because they mostly are guys, who come in arms folded, um, closed mind, um, thinking to themselves, here we go again, which by the way is a UGR, um, and who aren't receptive to anything that an outsider can bring, completely open up in a very short time because all of a sudden they're hearing, word, hearing words that resonate. So, yeah, I think your notion is an issue. I, I've not thought of it in those terms before, but I think leaders being able to talk real and to be able to resonate with people is critical. Maybe it's, maybe it's the, one of the most important critical in critical elements of being a good leader. Yeah. In fact, it probably is. <laughs> and that's how I wanted to um, spend some time with you today was just to, to unpack that, that element because it is so important in leadership, that communication element, but around um, culture because that is also... So the question, the next question is, why is it so important then? for us as leaders to know about and develop our cultures? It's, oh, well, it's, yeah. yeah. See, that's, that, that's an interesting question because there's many people who talk about culture, but that's all they do. They just talk. Yeah. And the workplace... Talana, I, I, I've, I've, we have unearthed the fact that there are so many unhappy people in the workplace. It is mm -hmm. gobsmacking how many unhappy people there are in the workplace. And many people have given up hope of it being any different. And I include leaders in that as well. And that's sad. At the very least, it's sad. But there is a business case that sits behind this. So we did some research a little while back. And we, to be honest with you, stumbled across what I now think is a terrific question. We, we posed this question in our research. We said, if the culture of your workplace was to become as good as it realistically could, how much improvement would there be on people's performance slash productivity? Mm -hmm. The culture of your workplace was to become as good as it realistically could, how much improvement would there be? Now, we gave people in the research a sliding scale. Let's start it from zero because zero is a legitimate answer. You might think the culture now realistically is as good as it's going to get. And then we gave an incremental scale, 10, 20, 30, up to 100, and then 100% plus. Now, Pre-COVID, I used to ask leadership teams this face-to-face -face before revealing the results we got from our research. And to this day, it, gobs it is gobsmacking the percentages that I would get when I asked leaders to reflect on this. Because, and I've done this a lot, when I do it face-to-face, -face, the average across leadership teams when I ask them this question is around 40%, 4-0. 40%. And I would say to leaders, I would say to leaders, are you serious? And they would go, yes, because some would be higher. Like some would be 
80, 100, 200, others would be 20. But on average, and I just do this on a whiteboard or on a flip chart in front of people, I'd say, well, help me, what's the average here? And, and inevitably, it would be around 40%. And I'd say, are you serious? And they go, yes. And I say, well, let's presume you're wildly over-optimistic. Let's halve it and say 20%. Would you take it? And of course, I'd make a joke about it because I'd say, the correct answer here, folks, is duh. You know, I mean, <laughs> where else are you going to get a 20% performance improvement? Name me one measure, one, in, one initiative, one yes. program that you can implement where you're going to get 20% performance improvement. I mean, this, it's remarkable when you think about it. And so what's my point? My point is there is enormous capacity, enormous capacity for performance improvement that rests at our feet. It is the culture of our workplace. You see, what I've realised is that there's a number of hurdles that we need to overcome before this is going to be seriously addressed, right? So the first hurdle is, is there good intent? Like, do leaders seriously have good intent to constantly improve? If the answer to, to that is yes, that's the first hurdle overcome. But the next hurdle is one that is often not addressed, and that is, what's the business case for us focusing on this? Because my belief is that many leaders truly don't get the business case. Well, that's it. My question, the 40%, half to 20, is the business case for focusing on culture. Now, if we can, we, we can tick that off, then the next logical question, if, if we're at that point now, then typically leaders will be on the edge of their chairs because the obvious next question is, so tell us, how do we do this? Because this notion of culture is so complex that people don't know what they're meant to do, where to start, how to do it, what's the best way. And it, it shouldn't be complicated because the simple answer to this is, well, we've got to understand our current UGRs and we're going to, we've got to fight for the UGRs. They're going to satisfy two criteria. One, what's going to make this a great place to work. And two, what's going to ensure our success in the future. We've got to fight for an aspirational culture um, and get the UGRs aligned with that um, in order for us to make any progress on this, you know, so, um, you know, I think that business case for culture is so often glossed over yeah. and not genuinely attended to because it's right. If we don't have a business case for something, what's the point? And that's a right position of case if, if, to take. If there is no business case for this, then there is no point. And so I think, maybe consultants who've worked in this cult, workplace culture space have a bit to answer for there because I think it's too often just presumed, you know? Yeah. yeah. Okay, Steve, so, so with that then, having the business case in place then for working on and developing um, a company's culture, that they, it really can impact so positively on, on people's performance. And there's actually also so much that we could explore related to, to UGR. So I really am encouraging all of us to look into Steve's website and books um, to, to understand this concept more. I'll put the info in the show notes. But I think for a short, short time together, I really wanted to just focus on aspects of communicating the UGRs because you've explained a bit about, you know, there is a process. It is possible to develop a culture to improve it. Um, so maybe if we could just start again, if we go back to the definition, it's about people's perception of this is the way we do things here. And, and you talk about it's been unwritten ground rules. So I just wondered, what is the unwritten part? What makes a UGR unwritten? Um, because, <laughs> see, what we did, when we got two universities involved in our world first research, we um, discovered through that research that there is a way of unearthing the prevailing, the current UGRs. And what we did is we got people anonymously to complete the sentence to what we now call lead in sentences. So that's lead in sentences. Yeah. And in our research, for example, we got people to reflect on the way we do things around here and got them to complete this sentence. Around here, customers are. Now, 
we were <laughs> amazed at what came back because I'm not kidding you. We literally had these words around here. Customers are a pain in the ass. Now I'm not, yeah, that's literal. We literally had those words. Sure. Another person, another person wrote around here. Customers are an interruption to my working day. I kid you not. Sure. Now these organizations, five companies were involved in the research. These organizations had wonderful documentation proclaiming their commitment to customer service. What a load of rubbish if they're the prevailing UGRs. So this stuff is never written down. Mm. It's the stuff that's, you see, when a person joins an organisation as a new person, and they can be senior, it doesn't matter what level of seniority, when a person joins an organisation, almost without exception, they will stay quieter than they otherwise would. Now, why is that the case, right? And I put this to groups when I, this is pre-COVID when I was doing conferences and I'd speak to within companies. Um, I'd say, why are we staying quieter? And people would say, well, um, they're getting a lot of the land. They're working out things. And I would say, okay, I agree with all of those. Let me paraphrase what you've just said and put this to you. We stay quiet. Why? To check out the UGRs. Yeah. <laughs> now, we don't have the term UGRs in our heads, but this is the natural human instinct. By the way, not confined to work. In, this is a function of being human beings. Any group, any new group that we're confronted with, we will normally, not always, but normally stay quieter. Why? To check out the UGRs. Why? In order that we can conform. So this stuff sometimes isn't even talked about, but we deduce it. We're looking at cues and clues. We're looking at stuff in a, in a workplace context. We're looking at stuff like, do people contribute at meetings or do they stay silent? Um, how, are, how, are, how are mistakes treated? Um, what do people say when the boss is there? When they say, what do they say when the boss walks away? Um, punctuality, do people arrive at the death knock? Are they looking at the second hand of their watch ready to sprint once it's finished time? Or this works in both, this works in both directions. If it's a five o'clock finish, and everyone is still there at 6.30, is the first person to leave at 20 to 7, frowned upon. So um, I, I don't know what it is that educates us about the need to tune into this. Um, <laughs> I, I really don't. In fact, I've never reflected on that. Um, but I worked it out at pri when I changed schools in primary schools. Like I was a primary school kid. I think I was grade three. Um, I quickly learned never to use the phrase back in my old school. <laughs> um, because that got you nowhere, you know. Um, so it, it, it's almost like we're wired this way to tune in. Um, now, sometimes it is talked about. It'll be sometimes UGRs are explicitly talked about. It might be in the car park after work or it might be in the meeting after the meeting um, or it might be just subtle cues, you know, like it might be a sort of under the breath, you better be careful. Yeah. what you say in front of this this person you know so they're 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 unwritten they're never written down um they are often unspoken but they are often widely agreed um and the vast majority of us conform because there are big consequences for not conforming um you can be excluded from groups for not conforming um yeah they are enormously, look, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I was working with a group, um, a group, uh, this is an organization that organizes mastermind groups for CEOs and senior people around the country in Australia. So there's, there's, there's these in South Africa, there's these, the same sorts of things in, in, in everywhere. So I'm invited, this is a group of around 12 CEOs who meet and there's a lot of them. Um, throughout Australia, within each of the cities. And I was invited to present to one of these groups and I introduced UGRs. And one of the guys, soon after, after I introduced UGRs, goes like this, he goes, oh, I don't believe it. And I stopped and I said, did you want to share what you're thinking here? And he says, Steve, I used to be in another mastermind group. And there was a UGR in that mastermind group which said, around here, new members to our group are to be treated with the deepest suspicion until they prove us wrong. 
So he said, I was cold and aloof with those new people. He said, I've joined this new group. And he said, there's a UGR in this group that says, around here, new people to our group are to be welcome for the contribution they can bring until they prove us wrong. He said, I'm almost physically giving them a hug. Now, here's the point. This is a senior guy, CEO of his own company, whose behaviours and personality are being dictated by a group with which he meets once a month for half a day or a day. I mean, it's got extraordinary power, yeah. um, you know, and unwritten. You'll never find them documented. It's remarkable. Sure. So, so then how are UGRs communicated? Because it sounds like it, well, one way to uncover them, I suppose it's, the question is around both. How do we uncover them? But to do that, we need to notice how they could, how they communicated. The one is through through those um, leading sentences. We can ask around okay, well, here, people, yeah. and then, yeah. and it's basically it's their behaviour. It's it's how people are behaving, and the, the rules that are governing that behaviour. So well, see, there's 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 two questions. There's two issues yeah. in what you're talking about. There. So one is how we can how can we unearth the prevailing UGRs, and I'll talk to that in a minute because there is a, this simple process for unearthing the current UGRs. But, but there's another question, I think, which is implied in what you're saying, and that is, so how are they created um, in the first place? How are UGRs sort of created? And I think this doesn't cover everything, but there's three major sources, and that is what gets recognised. So if I deliver great customer service and my leader says, you've done brilliantly there, I really appreciate how well you've done in dealing with that customer, then that's great customer service being recognised. So what gets recognised helps create UGRs, right? But there's a flip side of that, and that is what doesn't get recognised. So if I um, really go all out to support one of my colleagues and nothing is said about that, then it's probably likely I won't do that again, right, because it gets me nowhere. So what gets recognised, what doesn't get recognised, and the third element is the difference between what people say and what they do. So if we've got a leader saying customer service is our number one priority and then the next day they can be heard talking about customers in a disparaging way, then there is you know, a big difference between what, they, between what they're saying and what they're doing. And that disparity helps create UGRs. Um, so I, in general terms, that's how UGRs are created, I think. Yeah. Um, so then we come to, well, how can we unearth the prevailing UGRs? Well, that's where we can lean on the world first research done by those two Australian universities because um, we undertake what's called a UGRs stock take, um, which is like a survey. We sort of avoid the use of the word survey because there are UGRs to do with surveys. And it goes like this. Around here, we have a survey every year Nothing happens, so why bother to treat it seriously? So we try to avoid the use of the word survey. And we put in our UGR stock take a number of lead-in sentences. But we don't just pluck these out of thin air. We say the first step is to say, what kind, what's the culture that you're fighting for? In the interests of you being successful and being a great place to work, what, cult, what specific kind of culture are you fighting for? Now, many companies have value statements. The values might answer that question. Or you might want to consider that question as a separate question. That is, what kind of culture do we need to have in place for us to truly be successful while making this a great place to work? And there needs to be agreement. And there needs to be cohesion across the leadership team about that kind of culture, that aspirational culture. And we can call them values. It doesn't matter but there needs to be agreement about that. Then what we can do is craft lead-in sentences to link to those values or cultural attributes. So I'll give you an example. It might be that we are fight, part of our culture that we're fighting for is respect. So how would your people complete this sentence? Around here, people are treated. So that opens a window into that particular value or cultural attribute. Um, it might be that you're fighting for constant, constant improvement 
Well, then we'd craft a lead in sentence like something like around here when someone comes up with a new idea. Um, and you might have a value or a cultural attribute of teamwork. Well, there's two elements here that you can include. One might be around here when someone needs help. So that's sort of an internal teamwork element. Mm -hmm. But we might also want to put in around here when it comes to dealing with other work areas. So that's a cross-departmental element. And we've been doing this for 30 years, doing these UTRs stock takes. And I can tell you, it is <laughs> gobsmacking what we get back. It is gobsmacking. Because we, have, we can do an online version of this and we have a, an open text, text box, so it's free text. But next to each of the text boxes, we do an interesting thing. We have, we get people to self-categorize their response. So after they've completed the sentence, we say, have a text box. Do you think this has a positive, neutral, or negative impact on the organization overall? So if somebody writes around here, people are treated like school children, they tick the negative box. People are treated with respect and dignity, they tick the positive box. Somewhere in between it would be neutral. So now we've got two forms of data. We've got quantitative, the percentage breakdown of positive, neutral and negative, self-categorised uh, responses for each lead in sentence. And we've got the qualitative, which is the words which we bunch up into groups of positives, neutrals and negatives. And it is amazing what comes back. It is truly amazing. Um, and that's, that's the simple way of capturing the prevailing UGRs. It's got to be framed appropriately. And this is where communication is very important. You know, what's the purpose of this? Why are we doing this? Can you protect my anonymity? Because that's vital. I mean, it's a minute that people feel that they're going to be able to be identified, they won't do it. Um, and by the way, a UGR causes them to, do it, to not do it. Yes, that's what yes. they believe. Um, so yeah, look, if we can set the right context by appropriate communication around that, then, because here's the deal, to the extent there are unhappy people in the workplace, the vast majority do not want it to be that way. Yeah. They have merely given up hope of it being any different. And we've got to do something about that. You know, yeah. For me, that that's so sad. It doesn't have to be like that. It just it takes. It. But then, it, um, so then it takes for me a strong leader, so a strong leadership team, and that's I think where you start off getting the leaders to decide on what is the culture they want, and then they really have to then um, drive it. <laughs> well, one of my favourite questions for leadership teams is this and i i love this question and i think it ought to be asked um, of every leadership team right and the question we ask is this um well i'll give you an example i was working with a major company in the uk and they're a retailer they used to be bricks and mortar retailer they've moved to online and they've got six hundred people in their IT division. Like this is a major company, 600 people. And we're doing UGRs with their IT division, 600 people. And I said to the leadership team of this IT division, I said, if I was talking to your people and you're not in the room as leaders and they're being open and candid with me, how would they answer this question? What are your leaders top three priorities? So you're not in the room, but your people are speak, speaking openly and honestly. And to his credit, one of the leaders in the room, after a long pause, said, Steve, we don't even know what our top three priorities are, so how would they? <laughs> now, the point I made to them is this. You don't go to jail if culture isn't a top three priority. But unless it is, then guess what? It's not a top three priority. Yeah. So not only have, have you got to crystallise your view of the aspirational culture, culture, but you've got to get serious about it to the point, I used to say top five. No, blow that. It's got to be a top three priority 
because unless it is, it will gain no traction. So, you know, then there's another series of questions that can follow from that. And that is, well, what can we do as a leadership team to demonstrate that it is a top three priority? You know, and there's a whole path we can go down in that regard. But, you know, so much of this is just talk, you know, and there's a fundamental question, either we're serious this, about this or we're not. And if you're not serious about it, you're probably better off not to have value statements because all you're doing is giving your people ammunition that they can use against you because they know you're not serious. You know you're not serious. So why, why pretend, you know, um, get serious or not, you know. And if we are serious, there is a path we can go down. And, you know, UGRs is one of those options that are open to you. So, so let's then say we've got the business case for developing the culture. The, the leadership team is serious. They've made it one of the top three priorities. So their role is to start demonstrating, so actually behaving in the way that supports those, those UGRs. Um, well, yeah, yeah. That, that's 100% right. And there's, there's two things that need to happen here. So our, our, our approach, we would recommend doing a UGR stock take where we find out what the current UGRs are. In the first instance, we give the results of the stock take back to the leadership team. And the key question then is, are there areas of concern from this stock take? And inevitably there will be. And therefore, what can we do differently as leaders? We're serious about this. Let's reflect on our own individual and collective behaviors as a leadership team. What can we do differently? That's vital. But you know what? I think there's a trap that many leaders can fall into, and that is thinking that they are the sole, they have sole responsibility for the, for the culture. That is false and dangerous thinking because our view is that leaders are primarily but not solely responsible for the culture. So after working with the leadership team, our recommendation is that this ought to be shared with all staff staff play the game of UGRs. In fact, staff can sometimes, maybe often, take a cop-out position. And that cop-out position can be, if only they fix things up, we'd be okay. Now, that's a cop-out, you know, because we, once you learn about UGRs, we know that we all play the game of UGRs, mostly unconsciously, but once you learn about UGRs, it's a conscious thing. So our recommendation is you share the results from the stock take with staff as well as unedited as you can possibly make it and get them thinking about, well, what can we do collectively and individually to make a difference here? And that, that's when things can get genuinely exciting because we, if we can create sufficient momentum we, and if we can get enough people fighting for this aspirational culture, that becomes a genuinely like once or, t or twice in a career opportunity to be involved in genuine culture transformation. And it's exciting and becomes unstoppable. We'll give you an example. We've worked with Kmart in Australia, not affiliated with Kmart in the US, but it is a discount department store. By Australian standards, quite large. It has 30,000 employees and 220 stores across the country. Australia and New Zealand, actually. Um, so we worked with them for eight years and they had literally lost money for 10 consecutive years, literally. New leadership team came in um, with the new leader, whose name is Guy Russo, the best leader I've ever met. He loved UGRs and they used UGRs as the vehicle to understand and improve their culture, which was toxic. It was really bad. They are now Australia's leading retailer, um, half a billion dollars in profit last year. But more importantly, their culture transformed 180 degrees to a point where staff now are so proud of the company and their culture that they become a thermostat themselves. The staff create the thermostat, protecting the brilliant culture that they have and fighting for it. And if a new staff member comes in and starts talking negatively about customers or whatever, they are pulled into line by staff. And that's when you know you've got the game beat. Now, you know, it's a never ending story. I mean, it, it must, we must continue to fight for this, 
but you know you've got to beat when, once that happens. And I think so few organisations have achieved that. And that's what I think is so genuinely exciting. The prospect, you know, they're not special people at Kmart. It's the same people who are living in the toxic, you know, loot, money losing company who are now in the brilliant culture that is making yeah. half a billion dollars profit. You know I mean? The same people um, with a few exceptions, but it's, it's, there's, there's no special people. There's no special wand. It's just, are we fighting for this and are we doing it the right way? You know, and that's exciting. Yeah. And working together on it. So, so a big part of that is then is having the conversations around people's behavior. So it's like the softer side of business, the people side, and it sounds like a lot of behavior change. So, so part of what you're saying is, you know, once you've got the vision and the UGRs as a leadership team, you go back to the rest of the organization, you show them, you know, the, this is the way we're behaving. Do we want this or do we, would we prefer something else? So for me, there's, there must be a lot of times where we have those challenging conversations and I, I call them the conversations that count because they're the ones that really give us the opportunity to confront what we need to so that we can shift and change and hopefully improve. So I want to ask you to move a, a bit if there's any tips you've got around having those, those conversations. Um, yeah, look, you're spot on there. You're so spot on. When, when I do sessions, I try to make them as much fun as possible because the truth is this is potentially very confronting. Yeah. And you are so right in saying that there is a hard edge to this. This is not all soft, flowery, kumbaya stuff. We've got to have some difficult, some hard discussions. I'll give you two examples. And that's, again, where I think UGRs has huge potential because we can use the language of UGRs, right? Mm. So that's, that's, that's where there's a massive opportunity here. I'll give you two examples. I was working with a Kmart group in regional Australia, around 40 or 50 people in the room, and we are debriefing the outcomes from a UGR's stock take. And one gentleman is saying something in front of everyone else in the room, and I ask him a question after he's finished. And I know the answer to the question before I put the question to him. Because what I say to him is this, I say, what you've just said now, that was difficult for you, right? And he goes, <laughs> in typical Australian way, he goes, bloody oath, that was hard. And I said, well, maybe you've just taught us all something. And maybe it's this. Maybe we need to go into one or 2% levels of discomfort before we make any progress on this front. And I really mean it. I think he taught me and the rest of the people in the room something massive. He didn't go 50%. <laughs> He went one or two percent, maybe probably a bit more, because he was feeling, you know, discomfort in saying it. It was it was uncomfortable for him. But I think if we can share that with people, it gives us permission to, to broach the little more the, 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 the more difficult issues. You know, just veering slowly. There's no on-off switch for trust. So we've got to take baby steps uh, and go into one or two percent levels of discomfort. Now I'll give you a second example. I'm working with a, well, I'll name the company because these guys did brilliantly. It's called Ambulance Victoria. These are the paramedics that service the whole of my state in Australia. And um, one of the senior execs, who's a lovely guy, who's now the CEO, interestingly, but one of the, C, one of the senior execs, um, after I did a presentation to the executive team, said, Steve, I want you to work with my leaders. This is, I love UGRs. Um, so what you did for the exec team, I want you to do for my leaders in a half day session. His name's Tony. And um, so I said, sure. So I did the half day session uh, with his leaders. There's around 50 people in the room. Tony sat up the back and it went really well. They loved it. And at the end of the session, I spoke to Tony and off I went. Afterwards, I spoke with Tony, like this is a week or two afterwards. And Tony said, I've learned something massive. And uh, I said, what? He said, well, let's put it this way. He said, I was severely reprimanded at the end of that session. And I go, why? He says, because one of the leaders in the room came up to me and he said, 
So, and Tony said to this guy, great session, right? And this guy says, well, it was a great session, but clearly you weren't interested. And Tony goes, why would you say that? And he says, because you were sat behind your computer for the entire, entire half day doing your emails or whatever. You weren't participating. The rest of us were. And Tony says, no, but I'd gone through the session before. And he says, well, that's not the message you're conveying. Mm. Um, so Tony says he's learned from that remarkable bit of feedback that how he's seen by others is vitally important. And he's got to be completely conscious of that, you know. But what UGRs did was gave that guy permission to give that feedback to Tony, which he otherwise yes. wouldn't have. Yes. And what I, what I counsel people with is I say, you can use the language of UGRs to broach this. Mm -hmm. So he could have, if he, if he had it done it in a more sophisticated way, he could have said, Tony, there's a UGR that I picked up from your behaviour in the room today. And I may, may have been interpreting it incorrectly, but I'm seeing you sit behind your computer for the half day and I'm picking up a UGR which says around here, Tony doesn't really care about this stuff. So he could have been more sophisticated, but using the UGR's language to actually broach the issue and recognising up front as part of that communication, I might be perceiving this wrong, but this is my perception. That's where it comes to the definition. UGRs are people's perceptions of this is the way we do things around here. So you might disagree with their perception, irrelevant, that's driving their behaviour. So we can work on that perception bit as a sort of, to cushion a direct confrontation, if you like, mm. um, to address this. Now, you know, yeah. I'm not a communication expert. You could probably frame this even better, but I think using the UTR's language can really help in that regard. Definitely, it, it does, because it gives us, um, it's not so personal then, we don't have to, it, yeah, it gives us the language to, to talk about it. Um, let me see what else I had here. So the, the part of that is also feeling safe to speak up. I think you touched on it earlier, because there's a lot that I find, you know, I do, I do work, a lot of work with people who are very quiet, reserved, shy, or they fear speaking up in public, but that's a, a small part of, of also the often it's the culture it's not safe to to speak up so i know you you've experienced this in some way in speaking about the culture especially if there's a ugr that's it's not safe to talk about these things but are there any tips then for leaders that would help make it safer for people to talk about it i mean it sounds like just having the language of ugr ugrs already um for me would make it safer easier as well. Well, that's the first step, yeah, but there's other stuff that people can do, obviously, and, and, and must do. And you know, we've got to recognise that some people are introverts and, and, you know, genuinely understand and appreciate that. that um, but two, two immediate thoughts come to mind. If, if we are serious about our culture, it's like when I work with mining companies, um, I love asking this. Like, I, I would say to people, in, this, in your company, in your mining company, are they serious about safety? And many times they'll say, absolutely. So I will say, so what is it that tells you? Why do you come to that conclusion? What is it that's happening that enables you to form the view that they are genuinely serious about safety? And that, that's a good question to pursue. What, what, is the, what, what information are you using to come to that view? And one of the key things is this is constantly talked about. It is constantly talked about. And people are serious about talking about it. So we can learn from that and apply it to culture. So I say to leaders, if culture is a top three priority, then one of the cues you can give to tell people it is a top three priority is to constantly talk about it. So I'll give you the Kmart example. I'm sitting in with the senior executive team and I say to them, how often do you meet? Every Monday morning. Do you have standing agenda items? Yes, we've got two standing agenda items. What are they? The two standing agenda items are safety and finances. So I said to them, so culture's not important. And Guy, the CEO, says, no, it's important. I say, no, it's not. Safety and finance is important. 
And Guy says, we're changing our agenda structure. We're having three standing agenda items now. Uh, so our view is that culture must be a standing agenda item at meetings. So where everyone in the business attends a meeting every two weeks, every th- you don't overdo it, but you don't want to underdo it. So every two or three weeks, there's a standing agenda item. How are we going on our culture? And there's two parts to this conversation. What are we doing well? What are the opportunities for improvement? And you could take each value one at a time. You know, one value, one meeting, another value, another meeting. What are we doing well? What are the opportunities for improvement? Now, if you've got introverts who don't like speaking in larger groups, well, you put them into smaller groups to start off with. So if you've got 12 people in a room, you make three small groups. Have a conversation. What are we doing well amongst your group? Because, you know, like I've I've worked in Asia where often people, um, there's a UGR in many Asian regions about speaking in front of large groups, particularly when leaders are in the room. So put them into small groups. They're very happy to speak. And then you can get one spokesperson from each group. Um, So, you know, we can think about tactics um, to make it easier for people and how you respond to stuff that's less than positive is also a key factor here because if you're um, rejecting or denying or showing bad body language to any feedback that's less than positive, well, guess what? There's a UGR being created. (laughs) Don't raise negative feedback, you know? So... We've got to be so sensitive and aware of our own behaviour as leaders and help other people become aware of that as well. We've got to make it safe, inch by inch, baby step by baby step. Um, But if you do this long enough, then then a new new UGR will be created. And that is, Mm. around here, they're serious about this culture stuff. It's not just a flash in the pan, you know? Yeah, and hopefully around here we do something to improve our culture. We would also want that to UGR. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's just one other aspect then around the accountability then, holding people accountable to the change. I think you, you mentioned it's not just the leadership's role. They, they're obviously important and it's, I think because they initiate and they set the tone and the context, but it is the whole organisation. But is there anything else in terms of, because you've given us some great points on how to have these difficult conversations. Is there anything else to add around the accountability aspects when you want to hold so, people? Yeah, look, and, and, um, I, I, was, I was actually working with a funeral company. I mean, we did UGRs at a funeral company. Can you believe that? That was an interesting yeah. process. <laughs> and um, Doris was the head of this funeral company. And she's a great leader. It's very dynamic, intelligent, vibrant, a really great leader. And we did UGRs with her people and I rang her and I said, how's it going? And she said, Steve, we've got it beat. And I go, what do you mean, Doris? She said, I wasn't even at the premises, but I heard this story secondhand and we got it beat. We have won. I go, what do you mean? She says, two of my people were in the office and one of them pulls out a drawer on the suspension file and one of, the, one of the suspension files has a label on it, a tab, that reads management guff. Now, I don't know if that's a term that's used in South Africa, but translated, management guff means rubbish, management rubbish, you know, just whatever. Um, the other staff member sees this and says to the staff member who's pulling out the drawer on the filing cabinet, do you, that's, do you reckon that's the right thing to do, given our work on UGRs? She says yeah, you're right, I'm going to change it. Now, Doris's point is that's staff holding each other to account (laughs) and that's when you know you've got to be. So we've got, I think, to help. See, again, the UGRs language helped because that enabled that person to say, given our work on UGRs, do you reckon that's the right thing to do? But we've also got to help people frame their thinking about do... And, we can, and I will ask the question, do we give each other permission to hold each other to account in appropriate ways, right? Yes. So it's not bashing each other over the head with baseball bats, but it is broaching stuff that previously might not have been broached. And people will say, yes, we give each other permission, but then they're going to be helped. So how can we frame language? What happens if there's this sort of context? What sorts of ways could we frame words to address that. So we've got to give people assistance 
in helping put the words together, if you like, to help them broach this. And we've got to acknowledge people who are doing this. And that's got to be, that's got to be cherished and recognised. So I'll give you another example. After I see this guy, I tell the story about the guy going to one or 2% levels of discomfort, right? I tell that story to groups now as a way to encourage them to go into one or 2% levels of discomfort. So after I've told new groups about that story, if I see somebody displaying levels of discomfort, I will say to them, are you going into your one or 2% right now? And if they say yes, in front of the rest of the group, I will say, brilliant. Well done. Thank yeah. you. Good on you, right? It's actually encouraging them, recognising them for doing what we want them to do. And, you know, the same applies to helping staff challenge, uh, challenging others in appropriate ways. That's a big caveat. Yeah. Inappropriate ways. Those two words are separate. In Appropriate <laughs> ways. <laughs> uh, yeah. And look, I, I'm not, again, I, you, you're probably much better at this than me because I'm no communications expert. But I revert back to the point that I think the UGR's language gives us a new vocabulary to address this stuff, you know, in, in less confronting ways that it maybe otherwise would have been. Yeah. No, it definitely does. And it's, it's also, it sounds like just from what you said, it's making it safe, giving people permission to talk about it, um, giving them the language, giving them the skills to give feedback and receive feedback, you know, make that, that something that is celebrated and encouraged is that it is, we want people to be that one to two percent uncomfortable because that's where the change, you know, happens. That's the the bravery that we need, the the courage we need within the organisation. So yeah. maybe I could and just, yeah. No, no, I, I, you're right. And I was just reflecting a bit myself on the one or two percent, and I think using those numbers um, means that in their minds that might not be too difficult. <laughs> You know, so it's not too challenging a task to go one or two percent. Yeah. And and yet the the result of that is is way bigger than one or two percent. It's <laughs> the power of vulnerability, which is probably another conversation. But maybe I could just ask you. I don't know if, if it is a one or two percent for for yourself. If you could share to someone on a personal note. Um, we're all about the conversations that count in, in this podcast. So I just wondered if. You'd mind sharing just as we start to, you know, wrap up now, the last time you had a conversation that counted in your life. And if you could share just not necessarily too much about the content, but more about what helped. Why, why did it count and what helped you to have that conversation? Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's a tough one. Um, um, We, my, my Steph in, in um, Joburg, Steph Duplessis, great man. Um, my business partner has been for more than 20 years. Um, Steph and I, and Steph has actually said this, I haven't said it out loud prior to this, but Steph and I really have never had an argument in 20 years. Uh, in some ways, we are like a married couple. <laughs> We've never had an argument, but um, I think it's fair to say that um, we have annoyed each other on many occasions <laughs> during that 20 years. Um, but what I, what I really value in Steph, and I've learned from him actually, is that he will never let an issue sleep. I mean, I, I should have learned from Doris because Doris says, she has a 24-hour rule. If there's something that she's unhappy about, she has got to get back to that person to broach it within 24 hours because the alternative is it festering and then inflating in the minds of all parties involved. So Doris has a rule called 24 hours. That's good, right? Um, but Steph, and I've learned from Steph, that 
and I don't know if he's conscious of this, he will never let an issue fester below the surface. He will always raise it. And I think, I don't, again, I don't know if this is conscious. He will not raise it at peak anxiety. <laughs> he will let that abate before he does raise it, but won't let that go for too long. Yeah. Um, and I've learned a great deal from him in that respect. Um, I think, I think too much is left unsaid. And crazily, in the interest of not hurting other people's feelings. <laughs> yes. um, because that probably does thing, makes things worse. But we believe that, and it can get to a point where there is utter silence, where we play the silent treatment on each other. Um, we, we have a game that is heavily followed here in Australia, nowhere else, called Australian Wars Football. Like, it's not uncommon to get a crowd pre-COVID of 60, 80. The grand final gets 100,000 people at the MCG, right? And it's really treated seriously across Australia. Um, this crazy game we have. It's not rugby. It's not soccer. It's Australian Wars Football. If you, if you haven't heard about it, you won't know what it means, but yeah. it's big. Um, one of the coaches had an argument with one of the players. And these people are getting a lot of money, right? One of the coaches with one of the players, one of the star players, has an argument because the star player is not revealing whether or not he's going to another club next year, or whether he's going to stay with the existing club. And we learned through the press, and this has since proved to be true, that the coach and that player had the silent treatment for almost the entire year after that argument. And I, I think to myself, are we talking adults here? Yeah. All right. Are we talking adults? Because this guy is a senior leader of people, for goodness sake. And they have an argument and then they go the silent treatment for ever since. Because he did go to another club and I don't think they've ever spoken again. Which is truly remarkable. Um, it's truly remarkable. And I would say to leaders... If it's probable that you won't be good friends with the vast majority of people with whom, who, who you lead, mm -hmm. but isn't it in your best interest to try and make the best possible relationship you can with those people rather than give up? Um, yeah. Because the alternative is them just coming and doing the minimum. I mean, at the very least, that's the alternative. But then you've got the soured relationships and all the anxiety that goes with that. I mean, I don't know. Logic doesn't prevail too often, does it? <laughs> and, and in my experience and what I, I often try to show people, it's, it's more about how you have the conversation. Not really you should or shouldn't. It's really, there are ways, and I think you've shared a lot there, letting the emotion subside a bit, but then how you approach it having a language like UGRs is very useful, being very um, tentative in your feedback, saying, I'm not sure what's going on, but this is my experience of, of, a, of what happened between us, what's, what's happening for you. And that kind of like breaks the ice and allows us to, to then have that conversation that counts. So it's really just, yeah, for me about how we have it, because as you say, the, the opposite of not speaking at all, that silence is actually the repercussions are far more destructive and unnecessary because it's, it might be that one or 2% of discomfort to start the conversation, but usually everybody feels the relief and the, and you just get more clarity and you know where you stand with the other person and you can find a way forward, especially if that's your higher intention. If you want this to work, there's, is, there's always a way. So, so thank you for those examples. And um, maybe just, um, to ask how can people get hold of you if they want to know more about your work and ask you more questions or? Well, um, my email address is steve at ugrs.net for ugrs.net. Uh, if you want to get a closer to home UGRs contact, it's uh, Steph Duplessis. So if you look him up, um, it's stephduplessis.com. Um, there is a UGRs website, which is ugrs.net. Um, 
And if you can't find me <laughs> with those details, then <laughs> you'll never find me. But yeah, look, um, more than happy to take questions. And if any, if any people who are listening to this and viewing this would like to run their own stock take, the crafting of the words is very important. There is an art and a skill to getting the words right to craft lead-in sentences. So, um, you know, even without my involvement, I'd be happy to provide some advice. The sort of stuff you've got to avoid is asking, framing a lead-in sentence that invites a definition. So you wouldn't want, for example, a lead-in sentence to read, around here, quality is, because that invites a definition of quality rather than getting, gaining people's perceptions of the way we do things around here. So there is an art and a skill to framing those, and I'd be more than happy to help you frame them, even if I wasn't going to do it for you. I mean, because yeah, you, you can do this yourselves. Um, be more than happy to help. Great. Then I've just got to, um, two more questions. The one is about the, the picture we're going to put as, as you know, the, that goes with this podcast is you standing next to a fancy McLaren car. I don't know if you want to just explain quickly what, what that was about. Well, it's really interesting you throw this one in, right? Because I can show you a picture in a moment of a remarkable UGR, truly remarkable, because UGRs sometimes are in your face. Like when somebody's at a meeting and a new person says something that they shouldn't have, there's stunned silence, right? Now, we think that's subtle, but it's not. It's in your face of the new person, and they will never do that again, right? Yeah. So that's in your face. Sometimes UGRs are far more subtle, but I would argue no less powerful. And I'm really glad you've asked this because... We have worked with McLaren Automotive for four years. They did UGRs. So not the Formula One division. We're working with the automotive division, the division that makes road cars. The premises in Woking and Surrey are truly remarkable. I've never seen anything like it. And their cars are... I mean, I wasn't a car buff before being <laughs> going there. It is remarkable. Um, so there's high security when you go there. Once you get past, it's probably a 700 metre drive before you get dropped off. They're on a, on a large tract of land. Um, one morning I've got a driver. We go through security. We're 50 metres past security. And I asked, the, nowhere near where I need to get dropped off. And I asked the driver, can you stop right now? He's startled, but nonetheless stops. And I took this photograph. Take a look at this photograph. This is remarkable. Have a look at this. Um, that's not working. Let me go this way. Have a look at that. And tell me what you think the UGR is here. Can you see what he's got? Um, it's some kind of stick or something. It's a man standing by a, a hedge that's a bit disheveled in space places. The... But I is, that is a measuring stick. He is measuring the height of the hedge. Of the hedge. He's yeah, measuring the height of the hedge. So I say to people, what's the UGR? And people will say, precision, attention precision. to detail. By the yes. way, I went back next year, the year after that, and I took another photograph, and here is the hedge the following year. Oh, wow. Look at that. So he's measuring... The height of the hedge and i'm telling you that is mclaren there's a tension in the business right now because they've doubled the shift um, because they couldn't meet demand they've doubled the shift they still cannot meet demand and there's a tension in the business because the sales and marketing guys are saying come on we can get more we can sell more but the guys on the floor are saying no it's got to be right attention to deep that ugr has even <laughs> infected the gardeners I mean, I showed this to the senior exec team at McLaren. The CEO said, Steve, can I have a copy of that photo? He did not even know. And that is that is UGRs yeah. at play. That is truly remarkable. And I just wanted to explain to those that are listening that can't, couldn't see the picture. The first one, the, the, the hedge is quite you know, disheveled and uneven in spaces. The second picture you showed, it is perfectly straight. It's all grown filled in all the gaps it's like a perfect hedge so wow precision so that's um, mclaren yes great example um 
So to, to wrap up then, I just want to ask one more question. Is, is there a conversation that you believe we need to be having more of today that would make the world a better place? Oh, look, well, you know, you know my, my thinking is confined to workplaces. And, um, you know, I think it centres around what kind of culture do we need to be fighting for, all of us, you know. Um, we need... I really think the vast majority of organisations are leaving their culture to chance and luck. And we need to do a whole lot better than this. Um, and there's, 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 there's a joy at work element to this. And there is a business productivity element to this. And they are not mutually exclusive. Um, we can create joyous workplaces that are enormously productive by, folk, by, by asking ourselves, what can we do to make our culture even better than it is right now and being serious about that. And every one of us playing our part. And I think there's genuinely exciting opportunities from that. Great. Well, thank you so much, Steve. Thanks. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Talana Simpson, and this has been Let's Talk Communication. For more information about the show and my guest today, Steve Simpson, please go to the website innercoaching.co.za forward slash talk communication. You can also find us on iTunes and YouTube. And with the concept of unwritten ground rules in your mind, I hope you are able to go now and have even more conversations that count so that you can shift your culture, whether it's in your business or in your home, to a far more productive and joyful culture. Thank you for listening.